Chapter Thirteen of the Spoils of Poynton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Spoils of Poynton by Henry James. Chapter Thirteen. That she desired to ask no prudish questions, Mrs. Gareth conscientiously proved by closing her lips tight after Fleda had gone to London. No letter from Rick's arrived at West Kensington, and Fleda, with nothing to communicate that could be to the taste of either party, forbore to open a correspondence. If her heart had been less heavy, she might have been amused to perceive how much free rope this reticence of Rick's seemed to signify to her that she could take. She had at all events no good news for her friend, save in the sense that her silence was not bad news. She was not yet in a position to write that she had cut in. But neither, on the other hand, had she gathered material for announcing that Mona was undecerable from her prey. She had made no use of the pen so glorified by Mrs. Gareth to wake up the echoes of Waterbath. She had sedulously abstained from inquiring what, in any quarter, far or near, was said or suggested or supposed. She only spent a matutinal penny on the morning post. She only saw, on each occasion, that that inspired sheet had as little to say about the imminence as about the abandonment of certain nuptials. It was at the same time obvious that Mrs. Gareth triumphed on these occasions much more than she trembled, and that with a few such triumphs repeated she would cease to tremble at all. What was most manifest, however, was that she had had a rare preconception of the circumstances that would have ministered, had Fleda been disposed, to the girl's cutting in. It was brought home to Fleda that these circumstances would have particularly favoured intervention. She was quickly forced to do them a secret justice. One of the effects of her intimacy with Mrs. Gareth was that she had quite lost all sense of intimacy with any one else. The lady of Rick's had made a desert round her, possessing and absorbing her so utterly that other partakers had fallen away. Hadn't she been admonished, months before, that people considered they had lost her, and were reconciled on the whole to the privation? Her present position in the great unconscious town defined itself as obscure. She regarded it, at any rate, with eyes suspicious of that lesson. She neither wrote notes nor received them. She indulged in no reminders nor knocked at any doors. She wandered vaguely in the western wilderness, or cultivated shy forms of that household art for which she had had a respect before tasting the bitter tree of knowledge. Her only plan was to be as quiet as a mouse, and when she failed in the attempt to lose herself in the flat suburb, she felt like a lonely fly crawling over a dusty chart. How had Mrs. Gareth known in advance that if she had chosen to be vile, that was what Fleda called it, everything would happen to help her? especially the way her poor father, after breakfast, doddered off to his club, showing seventy when he was really fifty-seven, and leaving her richly alone for the day. He came back about midnight, looking at her very hard, and not risking long words, only making her feel by inimitable touches that the presence of his family compelled him to alter all his hours. She had in their common sitting-room the company of the objects he was fond of saying he had collected objects shabby and battered of a sort that appealed little to his daughter, old brandy-flasks and match-boxes, old calendars and handbooks, intermixed with an assortment of pen-wipers and ash-trays, a harvest he had gathered in from penny bazaars. He was blandly unconscious of that side of Fleda's nature which had endeared her to Mrs. Gareth, and she had often heard him wish to goodness that there was something striking she cared for, why didn't she try collecting something? It didn't matter what. She would find it gave an interest to life, and there was no end of little curiosities one could easily pick up. He was conscious of having a taste for fine things, which his children had unfortunately not inherited. This indicated the limits of their acquaintance with him, limits which, as Fleda was now sharply aware, could only leave him to wonder what the mischief she was there for. As she herself echoed this question to the letter, she was not in a position to clear up the mystery. She couldn't have given a name to her errand in town, or explained it, save by saying that she had had to get away from Rick's. It was intensely provisional, 
But what was to come next? Nothing could come next but a deeper anxiety. She had neither a home nor an outlook, nothing in all the wide world but a feeling of suspense. Of course she had her duty, her duty to Owen, a definite undertaking, reaffirmed after his visit to Rick's, under her hand and seal. But there was no sense of possession attached to that. There was only a horrible sense of privation. She had quite moved from under Mrs. Gareth's wide wing, and now that she was really among the pen-wipers and ash-trays, she was swept at the thought of all the beauty she had forsworn by short, wild gusts of despair. If her friend should really keep the spoils, she would never return to her. If that friend should on the other hand part with them, what on earth would there be to return to? The chills struck deep, as fleed a thought of the mistress of Rick's, also reduced in vulgar parlance, to what she had on her back. There was nothing to which she could compare such an image, but her idea of Marie Antoinette in the conciergerie, or perhaps the vision of some tropical bird, the creature of hot, dense forests, dropped on a frozen moor to pick up a living. The mind's eye could indeed see Mrs. Gareth only in her thick, coloured air. It took all the light of her treasures to make her concrete and distinct. She loomed for a moment, in any mere house, gaunt and unnatural. Then she vanished as if she had suddenly sunk into a quicksand. Fleda lost herself in the rich fancy of how, if she were mistress of Poynton, a whole province, as an abode, should be assigned there to the august Queen Mother. She would have returned from her campaign with her baggage-train and her loot, and the palace would unbar its shutters, and the morning flash back from its halls. In the event of a surrender, the poor woman would never be able again to begin to collect. She was now too old and too moneyless, and times were altered, and good things impossibly dear. A surrender, furthermore, to any daughter-in-law, save an oddity like Mona, needn't at all be an abdication, in fact. Any other fairly nice girl, whom Owen should have taken it into his head to marry, would have been positively glad to have, for the museum, a custodian who was a walking catalogue, and who understood beyond any one in England the hygiene and temperament of rare pieces. A fairly nice girl would somehow be away a good deal, and would at such times count it a blessing to feel Mrs. Gareth at her post. Fleda had fully recognized the first days, that quite apart from any question of letting Owen know where she was, it would be a charity to give him some sign. It would be weak, it would be ugly to be diverted from that kindness by the fact that Mrs. Gareth had attached a tinkling bell to it. A frank relation with him was only superficially discredited, she ought for his own sake to send him a word of cheer. So she repeatedly reasoned, but she as repeatedly delaying performance. If her general plan had been to be as still as a mouse, an interview like the interview at Rick's would be an odd contribution to that ideal. Therefore, with a confused preference of practice to theory, she let the days go by. She felt that nothing was so imperative as the gain of precious time. She shouldn't be able to stay with her father for ever, but she might now reap the benefit of having married her sister. Maggie's union had been built up round a small spare room. Concealed in this apartment she might try to paint again, and abetted by the grateful Maggie, for Maggie at least was grateful, she might try to dispose of her work. She had not indeed struggled with a brush since her visit to Waterbath where the sight of the family splotches had put her immensely on her guard. Poynton, moreover, had been an impossible place for producing. No active art could flourish there but a Buddhistic contemplation. It had stripped its mistress clean of all feeble accomplishments. Her hands were imbrued neither with ink nor with watercolour. Close to Fleda's present abode was the little shop of a man who mounted and framed pictures, and desolately dealt in artists' materials. She sometimes paused before it to look at a couple of shy experiments for which its dull window constituted publicity, small studies placed there for sale, and full of warning to a young lady without fortune and without talent. Some such young lady had brought them forth in sorrow, some such young lady, to see if they had been snapped up, had passed and repassed as helplessly as she herself was doing. 
They never had been, they never would be, snapped up, yet they were quite above the actual attainment of some other young ladies. It was a matter of discipline with Fleda to take an occasional lesson from them, besides which, when she had now quitted the house, she had to look for reasons after she was out. The only place to find them was in the shop windows. They made her feel like a servant girl taking her afternoon, but that didn't signify. Perhaps some day she would resemble such a person still more closely. This continued a fortnight, at the end of which the feeling was suddenly dissipated. She had stopped as usual in the presence of the little pictures. Then, as she turned away, she had found herself face to face with Owen Gareth. At the sight of him two fresh waves passed quickly across her heart, one at the heels of the other. The first was an instant perception that this encounter was not an accident, the second a consciousness as prompt that the best place for it was the street. She knew before he told her that he had been to see her, and the next thing she knew was that he had had information from his mother. Her mind grasped these things, while he said with a smile, I saw only your back, but I was sure. I was over the way. I've been at your house. How came you to know my house? Fleda asked. I like that, he laughed. How came you not to let me know that you were here? Fleda at this thought it best also to laugh. Since I didn't let you know, why did you come? Oh, I say, cried Owen, don't add insult to injury. Why in the world didn't you let me know? I came because I want awfully to see you." He hesitated, then he added, "'I got the tip from my mother. She has written to me. Fancy!' They still stood where they had met. Fleda's instinct was to keep him there, the more so that she could already see him take for granted that they would immediately proceed together to her door. He rose before her with a different air. He looked less ruffled and bruised than he had done at Rick's. He showed a recovered freshness. Perhaps, however, this was only because she had scarcely seen him at all as yet in London form, as he would have called it, turned out as he was turned out in town. In the country, heated with the chase and splashed with the mire, he had always reminded her of a picturesque peasant in national costume. This costume, as Owen wore it, varied from day to day. It was as copious as the wardrobe of an actor but it never failed of suggestions of the earth and the weather, the hedges and the ditches, the beasts and the birds. There had been days when he struck her as all nature in one pair of boots. It didn't make him now another person that he was delicately dressed, shining and splendid, that he had a higher hat and light gloves with black seams and a spear-like umbrella, but it made him, she soon decided, really handsomer, and that in turn gave him for she could never think of him, or indeed of some other things, without the aid of his vocabulary, a tremendous pull. Yes, that was for the moment, as he looked at her, the great fact of their situation. His pull was tremendous. She tried to keep the acknowledgment of it from trembling in her voice, as she said to him with more surprise than she really felt, "'You've then reopened relations with her?' "'It's she who has reopened them with me. I got her letter this morning.' She told me you were here, and that she wished me to know it. She didn't say much. She just gave me your address. I wrote her back, you know. Thanks no end. She'll go to-day. So we are in correspondence again, aren't we? She means, of course, that you've something to tell me from her, eh? But if you have, why haven't you let a fellow know? He waited for no answer to this. He had so much to say. At your house, just now, they told me how long you've been here. Haven't you known all the while that I'm counting the hours? I left a word for you, that I would be back at six, but I'm awfully glad to have caught you so much sooner. You don't mean to say you're not going home? He exclaimed in dismay. The young woman there told me you went out early. I've been out a very short time, said Fleda, who had hung back with the general purpose of making things difficult for him. The street would make them difficult. She could trust the street. She reflected in time, however, that to betray to him she was afraid to admit him, would give him more a feeling of facility than of anything else. She moved on with him after a moment, letting him direct their course to her door, which was only round a corner. She considered as they went, that it might not prove such a stroke to have been in London so long, and yet not to have called him. 
She desired he should feel she was perfectly simple with him, and there was no simplicity in that. Nonetheless, on the steps of the house, though she had a key, she rang the bell, and while they waited together and she averted her face, she looked straight into the depths of what Mrs. Gareth had meant by giving him the tip. This had been perfidious, had been monstrous of Mrs. Gareth, and Fleda wondered if her letter had contained only what Owen repeated. End of chapter 13